Welcome back to Cricket Aviation. My name is Jim Payne, and if you've been following along with my Creek Rebuild, you can see I've made a lot of progress over the last several weeks. Now, I'm really behind on several videos. Um, what's been completed since the last video has been the installation of the main landing gear. Um, we've also installed the belly fairing that covers the main landing gear leg. Um, I've also got the uh, intake and exhaust vents for the cabin air uh, in the bottom of the fuselage that we'll go over. Um, we've finished several things on the rear fuselage that I wanted to have done before I connected the rear and forward fuselage together. Uh, that included the horizontal tail bell cranks. I've also done the final installation of the rudder. Um, and you can see here we've got the uh, canopy forward fairing and also the canopy rear fairing that we've installed in addition to obviously connecting uh, the uh, forward and rear fuselage together. So I've got a lot of videos coming. I apologize for the delays. Uh, some of the delays on the video has been uh, issues I've had trying to get materials and hardware. There's been a lot of shortages in a lot of different industries and uh, aviation is, uh, is one where we've also had some issues with getting hardware and rivets and things like that. So uh, I, I tended to jump around on different projects where I could. I was working on the landing gear when I could. I was jumping to finish the uh, intake and exhaust vents and then working on the rear fuselage. Just trying to get everything done that I wanted to have finished before I did the final assembly of the rear and forward fuselage together. So that's pretty much been done here. Um, now in this video, what we're going to focus on is the uh, uh, fabrication and installation of the main landing gear. That's probably going to be in two separate videos because of the length. I ended up having to actually cut off my uh, Grove gear that I got because it was a little bit too tall. So we'll go over that also. So please uh, remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and uh, thanks for watching. What I'm going to try and make today is the um, brackets that hold and clamp the landing gear leg onto the Cree Cree. It's basically this assembly that you see here, it's, it's really two parts. There's uh, a part that's on top here and then there's this bottom part that is separate. And there's bolts that get inserted here and here and actually clamp uh, the gear leg in there. Whether or not you're using the aluminum gear leg or you make your own fiberglass one, you basically use the same part. So, what I'm going to do is take a uh, solid billet piece of aluminum and see if I can make and cut out these brackets on my mill. So what I'm going to start off to make those clamps with is this is 2024 20, T3. This is bar stock that is an inch and a half uh, wide. Uh, one direction and one inch the other way other direction and this is about 16 inches long This is a scrap piece that I had around the shop from making some of the tail fittings that I had uh, Made earlier so what I'm gonna start off doing is just go ahead and cut this into the length that I need for the two Brackets now because there's a top piece and a bottom piece the top piece actually consumes almost all of the the width of the inch and a half side here So I'll go ahead and cut that about 125 millimeters. I'll go and cut two pieces of those because those are going to have to be made out of just one solid one inch by one and a half uh, piece of aluminum and then what I'm going to do with the, the last section here is the part that's clamped on the bottom I should be able to split this down the middle and use uh, half of each uh, end of the inch and a half width here to go ahead and make the, the parts that bolt on the bottom of those so let me go ahead and cut these out and we'll see if we can start milling these into the shape they need to be I was able to get the rough cut parts um, out of that solid bar stock that I had for the landing gear components here. Uh, so these are the two uh, top halves that are gonna be for each side. Um, I cut these about two millimeters longer than they needed to be, just to give myself a little bit of extra room that I can finish off in the end. Um, and these are the parts that are going to be made that get bolted to the bottom. Uh, these are smaller, and what I did is I just took that bar stock that I had and I split it down the center. Now, I actually have a metal cutting um, chop saw that uses blades like this. It's just an evolution, uh, um, you know, metal cutting saw. 
I actually ruined this blade when I cut out the parts for the nose gear that were made out of the 4130 steel. So if you're gonna cut 4130 steel and you wanna use this blade, uh, don't, you will ruin it pretty much right away. I tried to cut aluminum for the first time when I tried to cut these uh, and it is completely trashed. It will not track and, and cut through even aluminum anymore. So uh, just a note on that. But if you do have a carbide cutting blade on a chop saw in your shop, you can cut 2024 T3 aluminum quite easily. It cuts through it like butter. So uh, just be aware you can easily cut this if you have a carbide blade um, on your saw. Now what I ended up doing for this here, because I had to split this down the middle, and if I had a bandsaw, I could have just run this through a bandsaw, it would have been pretty easy. I don't have a bandsaw anymore because I replaced it with this. Um, but what I did is I just took a scrap piece of crap 2x4 and I just cut a slot into it with my table saw so that I could fit a piece of aluminum in here and mark it down the center and then actually have some support and squareness so I didn't have to try to hold this with my fingers when I ran it through the uh, um, you know through my chop saw um, you can actually take a, a wood tab or something and screw it down to actually hold this into place again so you don't have to get your fingers quite so close but I was able to rip this right down the center it's almost perfect so um, so anyway now that I have the rough cut parts made what I'm going to do is go over to my mill and just mill these down to their proper thickness and width uh, so I'll go ahead and go and cut these down and I'll show you what it looks like when I'm done so I finished uh, milling these blocks out to approximately the proper size before we start cutting the sections out for uh, the, the clamp for the, the gear. Um, what I did notice though is, I first of all, I kept these you know maybe a half a millimeter thicker and wider than what the plans call for just for cleanup and stuff, just to have a little bit of extra space. Um, but I did notice that the gear leg from Grove, which is 5 eighths of an inch thick, thick is actually 1.3 millimeters thicker than what the gear is supposed to be to fit in between the clamps here that we're making. So I did add a little bit of width to this um, upper part and I also added about a millimeter to this lower part um, just so that if I'm gonna make this cutout that I have a little bit more material here than what the plans are showing because of that thickness of that gear. Now, one of the things I am actually thinking of doing is it wouldn't be a big deal for me to stick that landing gear leg into my mill and across the top of it just mill off 1.3 millimeters to get it down to the proper 15 millimeter thickness that is recommended in the plans. I am somewhat thinking of doing that uh, just because I know that that Grove gear is quite stiff um, and I have a feeling that if I were to take you know that one 1.3 millimeters off the top it's going to thin out the spring part which is the section that's actually in between the gear legs that mounts on the fuselage that's what's actually supposed to flex uh, you know upon landing so it would give me a little bit more flexibility if I took that off plus it would save uh, some weight um, so I'm gonna think about that uh, overnight um, and, and figure out what I'm gonna do but otherwise these uh, you know, are, are basically to the proper shape where we can now start uh, cutting them down and start cutting them out for the gear leg, which uh, I'm going to start working on next. I decided to go ahead and set up a simulation here to be able to apply weight to this landing gear that I got from Grove uh, to test a few things before I finished making the landing gear mounts for the Cree Cree. Um, so what I did is I just took some 2x4s here. I screwed in and created a attachment to the two by fours so that it would hold the gear on either side right in the center of this and my goal was was to basically sit on the end of this or put weight on the end of this and see how much this gear flexes in the middle how stiff it is um, but at the same time try and look at a few things here on the end uh, when we're at gross weight and we've got the Cree Cree on the ground ideally these tires would be completely um, vertical to the ground. So I'm just using a square on the end here just to check and see when I put weight on this, do these tires come out and level uh, vertically with the ground or do I have it uh, you know bending out or do I still have it uh, you know bent in a little bit um, just to determine how much this gear is flexing. But the other thing I wanted to check here also, so let me see if I can see this with the camera. But I'm trying to see, there's a little bit of space there on either side of that um, brake disc 
between the brake pads. There's just a little bit of clearance on either side, so it's not rubbing at all. But what I do want to check is that when I put weight on this, and of course what I'm trying to do is put about 180 to 200 pounds on the end of this, and because it's wedged underneath my CNC table, which will not lift up with 200 pounds, um, I can actually apply 400 pounds to this gear leg. Um, that's just how fulcrums work, <laughs> uh, is that I'm gonna put 200 pounds here and try and simulate 400 pounds or you know, 380 to 400 pounds of gross weight on the Cree Cree to check a few of these things. And what I want is to check and see how much is my uh, axles bending if at all they shouldn't be um, and I'm going to check that by checking that brake clearance just to see if that if that uh, axle is flexing at all that brake disc is going to go over and rest on uh, on the inside pad um, but I'm hoping that I'll just see exactly the same gap which means the, the, the axle is not flexing at all but the other thing I said I, I do want to check if the tires are vertical and then I want to check in the center here where I've got this 2x4 basically resting on top of the gear leg, I want to see how much that gear leg is flexing down because the spring action of these gear legs is really not on the sides here. It's really from here to the other side. It will actually flex down in the middle like a spring. Uh, so the two sides here will bend up um, and cause the center part to bow in the middle. So I'm gonna go ahead and just sit on this and I actually do have a scale over here. So I am gonna reset the scale by just applying a little bit of weight, getting it to zero out. And then what I can do is I can come over here and just sit on the end of this thing. Now, that's reading right about 200 pounds. It's actually going in between about 197 and about, uh, you know, just over 200 pounds. But then if I bring the camera over here, you can see my tire is almost exactly perpendicular to the ground. Uh, that actually looks quite good. So when I apply gross weight on here, this does appear to be the right amount of spring necessary to at least bring these wheels to the correct position so that they're not hanging, uh, you know, bent in or bent out. But now what I want to do is I want to do that same thing here and see if I can get a shot of these brake pads. Um, And since I don't have, I think I can see right in there, but the question is, is can I sit on it at the same time? Let me try that here. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna put weight on this. I'm probably gonna be leaning to one side, but I can see right here that I can still see space on either side of those brake pads and it's the exact amount of space that was there before at full weight on here. Uh, so I think, yeah, I'm, I, I'm good. I, I'm, I'm actually quite pleased with, uh, with what I'm seeing here. So this really, really looks good. Now, what I am curious to see is how much this is flexing down in the middle. And just so you know, I put these, uh, these plastic uh, sliders, it's actually some leftover packaging material underneath the tires just so they would slide on the, uh, on the wood down there as we're bouncing up and down uh, but we've got about uh, it's probably about it's probably about three-eighths of an inch you can see as I as I bounce up and down you can see how much this is flexing um, so I mean as far as this gear being stiff yeah it's it's definitely stiff but I don't think it's too stiff um, if this wasn't this stiff at gross weight, these wheels would start bending outward uh, upon a landing. And of course, I want to have a little bit of extra on there in case you know we did the one and a half G equivalent uh, drop test, uh, which would cause those tires to bend out if it actually had to flex that much, and it would bend down more in the middle here. But I'm quite pleased that at gross weight, I should have these tires perpendicular to the fro or to the ground. So. I'm gonna say this is good. I was really doing this test to see if I should shave some off the top of this gear leg to thin it out a little bit, but now after looking at this, I don't think I'm gonna do anything to this gear. I think this gear is good the way it is. Um, so I'm quite pleased at, uh, and it's definitely springing. I mean, it can, I can bounce up and down on it. So I don't believe it's, uh, I don't believe it's too stiff. 
All right, I was able to find enough weight here in the shop to stick on the end of this wooden frame that's holding the landing gear here. And I'm gonna go ahead and go through the whole process here of checking the, the, the weight um, and the deflection and also the position of the brake pads. Um, now what I did a second ago is I put gross weight on this of 200 pounds or 400 pounds total and was able to reset that brake caliper so that that disc was centered right in the middle of that brake caliper. So we're gonna go ahead and put the weight on it. We'll go ahead and look at it and see what it looks like. Now I gotta kinda do this quickly in order for this to not, this bathroom scale likes to just reset and read itself or read a reading really quickly before I get a chance to drop it down. So, all right, dropped it down. Okay, so we're actually over gross weight here. We're at 202.4 on this wheel, but we'll leave it at that for now. And we'll come over to the other side here and we'll go ahead and take a look and see how square we are here. If I put this right next to the tire and you can see I am hitting the tire on the bottom and I'm just barely grazing the tire at the top and uh, going right across the end of the, the axle here. But this is as close to, you know, vertical as you're gonna get uh, with this. So I think that's a good idea. Now let's check the brake disc here. Let's see if we can see the pad clearance here. Let me see, it's easiest to see from this side, I think. I'm trying to see if I can see it in the camera, right? There, you see the light between the rotor that side and the light between the rotor on that side. And so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go ahead and take, in fact, visually I can see that it's very close to center um almost exactly in the center so now what i'm going to do is let's go ahead and take the weight back off of it and we'll go ahead and let the gear leg relax uh, let's go ahead and jack this up okay so we've got the weight off of it now let's go back over here and let's take a look at the brake disc here from the back okay now uh, let's see if we can get the light to shine through there okay you can see the light on the left side there and the light on the right side now visually it looks to me like it moved a tiny tiny bit in other words as I let off this rotor seemed to relax out just a little bit and when all that 200 pounds was on it it tended to flex a little bit this way it's such a minute amount that I'm not really concerned about it. And when you think about it, we're gonna be setting up that brake caliper in the correct position with the empty weight on the airplane, but that's gonna include the airplane itself. So if the empty weight of the airplane is 175 pounds, like it should be, you know, we'll center that caliper right on that brake rotor at that weight. And then the only flexing it's gonna do is between 175 and then whatever, you know, gross weight ends up be, being, whether it's 380 or 400. Um, so you're gonna get less flex than what we're actually seeing here because we're going from basically no weight on it at all uh, to full weight on it. So I think I'm good. I'm not too concerned about it at this point. It would be nice, I think, to try and do some drop checks at some point. Uh, maybe see if we can figure out how to pick this up and actually drop it down and try and do that uh, one and a half G load test like they recommend that you do in the, uh, uh, you know, according to the FAA for a hard landing. Um, but I'm very happy now with the Grove gear. I think this is gonna work out perfectly. I like the fact that when I get gross weight on it, uh, my tires are vertical with the ground, which is what I wanted. So um, I, did check, I did check the clearance here at full gross weight is about 5 sixteenths of an inch. So that center is bowing and flexing about 5 sixteenths of an inch down, um, which is fine. I just wanted to check and see how much that uh, amount was, but we're looking good here. I'm gonna go ahead and start finishing working on the, uh, the attached fittings uh, that go onto the fuselage. I am going to compensate though for the current thickness of this gear, which like I said is 1.3 millimeters thicker. So I'm going to try and make the brackets height wise uh, 1.3 millimeters taller so that I have the same amount of material I can take out of the middle um, for the bottom half of those brackets. But I'll show you that when I get to that point of, of cutting those out. So this looks great. So I'm gonna start working on the next step here with these blocks uh, for the landing gear to mount. Uh, so the two upper blocks here, I'm gonna go ahead and start with these. And what I'm gonna do is start doing the cutout in the bottom here that's supposed to allow the, uh, or I'm sorry, in the bottom of the top part here, that's supposed to allow this bottom part to fit inside. So um, that's supposed to be, let's see, according to the drawing here, 
Uh, so it's this 96. What we're gonna do is just do this first cutout that goes all the way across. Then we'll go ahead and cut it out for the actual landing gear to fit into. Um, now, this cutout for the landing gear width-wise is supposed to be 50.3. I measured my Grove gear and it's about 50.8. So the Grove gear is at that two inch about uh, the, the two inch wide is about uh, 0.5 millimeters wider, so we'll have to go a little bit wider with the opening when we get to that point. But for now, I'm just gonna do the 16 millimeter down cut and all the way across to get the 96 to fit the bottom part in here. All right, I finished cutting out the upper parts of the landing gear clamp. Um, I don't have these so that they fit in here yet. I'll cut these down once I get these to the most part to their final dimensions, including what I'm gonna do next, which is actually make the cutout here for the top of the landing gear. So there needs to be a two inch wide um, cutout here at the top, and I need to make sure that I keep at least six millimeters of material at the top here. But I'm gonna go ahead and do that cutout on both of these and see if I can get this actually fit around the gear leg on the top half, and then we'll start working on the bottom. All right, I've got the top part of the landing gear bracket now notched out for the landing gear. So this fits over here. Obviously I'm fitting it on the bottom side, but it fit around the top side, but just fits around the outside of there. And so what I'm gonna do next is go ahead and cut the bottom piece that has to fit inside of here. I'm gonna cut the ends off of this until it just fits inside of each one of these. And after we do that, we'll go ahead and notch the bottom part out for the uh, bottom half of the landing gear. Okay, I've got the bottom half of these uh, landing gear clamps now so they fit nice and fairly snug, just slip fit into uh, the top piece here. So now what I'm gonna go ahead and do is mark and notch out the bottom part for the landing gear in here and see if I can get these clamps to fit all the way around with as little play as possible around the landing gear. And uh, I'll show you what it looks like when they're done. Okay, I have both um, bottom parts of these clamps for the landing gear done. Um, they now fit inside of here and they clamp perfectly around the gear leg, as you can see here. So now we're at a point where we can start drilling the holes for the bolts that hold these together. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drill the holes here that clamp the two halves together. Right, let me see if I can get these together there. I kept them a little bit snug. Uh, trying to do things with one hand. Anyway, okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drill the holes that clamp these together first, because I wanna bolt these together when I drill the, the bolts that fit on the end here. So I'm gonna start with these, get these threaded in here, get the clamping part working, and then we'll come back and start drilling in the end here where we have to thread into this part here and through the top part. So we're actually connecting the top and the bottom vertically and horizontally. Um, so let me go ahead and start drilling these and get these tapped down here and I'll show you what it looks like when they're done. So I'm waiting for bolts to arrive to finish uh, drilling the holes and putting the bolts into these uh, aluminum fittings that hold the landing gear. I decided to go ahead and cut out the metal plates that are supposed to mount to the side of the fuselage that actually support these aluminum brackets that we are creating here. So on the side of the airplane we basically are attaching these to the side of the fuselage with uh, four bolts on each side. This is actually gonna end up in, in the middle in between these two steel brackets. And then on the end, we're going to put a steel tube that the bolt is gonna go through that bolts into this aluminum assembly here. Um, so what I did is I cut these out on my CNC machine. Uh, it was quite a task because this is, I think, inch in, or uh, 1.5 millimeters thick steel, uh, 4130. Uh, my, my CNC uh, router was able to cut these out, although, like I said, it was, uh, it was a bit difficult. I didn't end up with a little bit of chatter, so I had some cleanup I had to do on these, but it worked. It was a lot easier than trying to cut them out by hand. So the other thing I did is I cut out these steel tubes that are going to be welded to the ends of these plates here. And so what I'm doing right now is I'm gonna head off to the welder and go ahead and take him these parts and see if he can weld these round tubes onto the end centered onto these fittings that I've already cut out. I've got four of these fittings to do. Two of them are 
the same uh, and and you know just two of them go on the front side and two of them go on the back side and they are cut slightly different this one's got a little bit deeper cut in the middle where the uh, wing um, attach uh, plate has to go on the um, aft side of the fuselage I'm sorry this is actually on the front side of the no this is the aft side of the fuselage aft side of the fuselage um, but one of the things I did here is when I go to the welder, I like to take him the necessary fixturing that he's going to need to try and weld these. So I created a steel plate here. And what I did is I started out with a 3 8 inch thick plate. I cut about two inches off of the end of it and I milled this down to the correct thickness so that if I take one of these plates here and put it on top of here and we can put a washer on top of here and a wing nut. Um, if I go ahead and take this steel tube and I roll it up against here, it will be perfectly centered between the plate here and the center of the, the, the tubing that needs to be welded. I'm going to take this to the welder so that he has a way of actually making sure that these are centered up and down here uh, on the tubes that I want to have welded. Anything that you can do to provide fixturing to your welder, especially if he's not used to doing what you're, or doesn't know really what you're bringing him, will save him not only a lot of time, but it'll make sure that your parts are done correctly. So what he can do is basically take any kind of, you know, steel, push it up against there to hold that into place. That can just sit there and he can go ahead and start welding a bead of weld on this side. And then he can take it out of this plate, flip it over and weld the other side. And when that gets done, it will make sure that when this is pulled off of here that this tube and this plate are perfectly centered. So I'm gonna head off to the welder and get that taken care of. Now, what we're gonna talk about, one of, the, one of the things when we get back is, or when I get back from the welder, is that I'm doing something different with these tubes. These are significantly thicker than what was required uh, in the plans because I'm going to have to make my own rubber bushing that supports the bolts that go through here that attach to these aluminum clamps. And so we'll talk about that when I get back. I'll show you how I'm actually going to make those. But for now, I'm just going to get these welded onto the bottom and see if I can get that step done and with all four of these. So I'll see you when I get back. All right, my uh, welder wasn't available today. Um, he's not going to be available till after the weekend. So I went back to these fittings here, or these clamps for the gear leg, and I went ahead and drilled and tapped the holes in here for the quarter 28. Uh, bolts that I'm going to use to connect the top and the bottom halves of these clamps together. Um, the tolerances on some of this stuff is very, very small. Uh, I did want to mention and sh actually show you in the drawing over here. Um, so this is the drawing for those fittings that I'm making. Now we're putting a bolt in here that clamps the two together and the edge distance from that hole to the opening of where the gear uh, actually fits through is is less than a millimeter if you do the calculations here you only have about uh, 0.85 of a millimeter of wall thickness left on those bolt holes that you're putting in there this seems a bit strange to me i understand this because of, of the, the the tolerances that we're dealing with with having to put a bolt in here that's got to have enough threads We've got to have this bolt that goes up we got to clamp all this together and have it work but you're gonna to have to be very careful when you drill those holes for these bolts that you give yourself enough space that you don't get those threads too close to the edge of that um, you know gear opening there I moved my bolts over uh, about a millimeter um, and it's only because I left myself a little bit of extra length here on the sides um, so that I still have enough threads to go through to connect the bolts in there uh, that you know go horizontally and actually attach to the uh, you know those metal uh, gear um, attach brackets that we're going to have welded. So it's just something to think about here. There's a few things on this on this bracket that it kind of surprised me. Also, is that um, these bolts that we're supposed to use to clamp these clamps together are actually supposed to be 180,000 to 200,000 psi tensile strength bolts. Now, if you if you know you know what aircraft hardware is, aircraft hardware is around 125,000 psi tensile strength. Um, a grade eight bolt is 150,000 uh, psi tensile strength, and you have to go all the way up to a grade nine bolt to get to 180,000 psi. So the bolts that are recommended to be used on these clamps is 
a grade 9 bolt to bolt this together and also a grade 9 bolt that goes in the end here that's actually going to attach to the uh, um, to the brackets that are on the fuselage. Um, so this surprised me a little bit, uh, partly because this is a this is a grade nine bolt that's steel that's going into an aluminum fitting with threads in it that you know are only thread at the top half here and threads that are that close to this opening here. I'm thinking, how in the world can we require a grade nine bolt in this situation when you know just looking at it, you would think that the threads would strip out of this aluminum fitting long before that bolt would ever break. Um, now, this bolt here is mostly in, uh, in you know, a tension situation. It's not in a shearing uh, situation. So again, you would still think that this bolt would rip out of these threads and these threads would give loose on this aluminum fitting long before the bolt would break. So I, I'm not exactly sure why the designer is specifying such a high tensile strength bolt here. Um, I am using a grade 9 bolt, and the only thing I can figure is that this bolt is probably undersized uh, compared to what it should be to attach this and carry these loads and, you know, repeatedly, you know, carry the landing loads on this aircraft. That's the only thing I can think of is maybe if we went up to a, uh, you know, 5 16th bolt instead of a quarter inch bolt, that then we could go down to 150,000 PSI or 125,000 PSI bolt. Um, but that's, that's the only thing I can think of. So I'm gonna follow the designer's recommendation that those should be a grade nine bolt uh, or higher. And that's what I'm using uh, you know, for my setup here. Now, if you're using the socket head cap screws that's recommended to be used on the end here, um, most of the, um, the black oxide socket head cap screws that I found to buy um, were actually 180,000 PSI. Um, so, I mean, that's what I went ahead and ordered for, for those bolts on top. But these, I had to go to a special, uh, you know, automotive grade nine bolt. Um, again, this is, this is beyond even aircraft hardware at this point. Um, and all these bolts here should be safety wired again. So I'm probably gonna have to drill the heads uh, on my bolts in order to put safety wire in them. But I just wanted to show you this fitting a little bit more and show you how this works. So the other thing that we're gonna have to do here is we're supposed to leave clearance here of 0.3 millimeters of gap there. And the purpose of this little circular cutout here at the top and the little gap there is that this is providing some clamping force. So the, these fittings are gonna hit in the corner here, but then having this opening here is gonna act kind of like a little bit of a spring. And then we're gonna leave a little bit of gap clearance here so that when we bolt this down, we have some clamping room to actually grip the gear. Um, instead of uh, you know just assuming that it's a tight fit against the gear, um, we can actually provide some additional torque and, and, and tension on the gear to clamp it. And that's probably critical if you're using the fiberglass gear, which is gonna be a little bit softer. Uh, it's a little, best, little less of an issue when you're using the aluminum gear, which is you know, very stiff and solid and hard. You can, you can actually mill this out to fit exactly and clamp down on it tightly without requiring the gap there. But I'm gonna go ahead and do this opening here and go ahead and do the gap in there also and just make these exactly like they're, they're recommended to be made here. Um, I was able to get a few more steps on these clamps for the landing gear. Um, I was able to drill and thread the, uh, the holes here for the bottom and top clamp that go together and then I was able to thread the um, the ends here where we're going to attach the metal fittings that connect to the fuselage. Now. Um, the bolts that I used here, this is a quarter 28 thread, um, and these are grade 9 bolts that I purchased that are in the end here, or in the bottom here. On the end here, these are 180,000 PSI 5 16 bolts. But anyway, I've got these threaded. They all came together really nicely. I'm very happy with how these are turning out. I do have this step still here from this part on the bottom being a little bit thicker because like I said, I increased the thickness of this because I had to cut out a little bit more uh, from the bottom of these fittings here in order to compensate for the thickness of the Grove gear, which is actually uh, about a millimeter and a half or one and a half millimeters uh, taller than uh, the, uh, the plan suggests. So I I'm probably just gonna taper this down here when I go and finish these and round these edges and clean these up and I'll just taper that down. I could probably just just cut that one and a half millimeters off that's hanging out there. Uh, you know, the plans do show that if 
your gear leg is taller that you can work this lower edge on this fitting here to make it so that the gear fits. And we've only got six millimeters on the top here of thickness, but yet down here I've got nine. Uh, it doesn't seem to make sense to me that the bottom should be thicker than the top when, when this is installed in the airplane, all of the weight is pushing up. You know, the, it's being held in, this is holding the spring gear in here at the top. This clamp is just keeping it from falling out. So I, I'm, I'm guessing I probably could just trim this off if I wanted to and I haven't decided exactly what I'm gonna do, but I'll figure that out. So the next thing we gotta work on though is I've gotta figure out a solution for the Polstra bushings that are supposed to be installed on top of these bolts. So the way the landing gear is supposed to work is this is supposed to hold the landing gear on either side. There's essentially supposed to be a, a fitting here that attaches to the frames on the side of the fuselage. And then we've got these circular parts that, as I mentioned before, are supposed to be welded onto the bottoms of these on the center. And then what we're supposed to do is we are supposed to have a Polstra bushing, which is actually a rubberized bushing. It's, it's, it's got a steel insert in the middle where a bolt would go through. It's surrounded by rubber, and then it's got an outer shell on it like this. And that bushing is supposed to fit inside of here, and it's supposed to be glued in place, and we're supposed to be able to then put these bolts right through that Polstra fitting, screw it into here, and then this is supposed to be attached to um, you know, our landing gear, similar to, to this. Now, um, you can't buy those Polstra bushings any longer. At least I've tried to find them, even tried to purchase them from Europe. Nobody has them, they're just not available. And I couldn't find a suitable substitute to replace them. So what I've decided to do is actually try and make my own bushings, uh, my own rubber bushings. So what I'm gonna do is I'm still gonna get this plate welded onto this circular part here. When that's welded together, what I'll have is just this steel tube with the bracket on it that sticks out. And then what I'm gonna do is I picked up some 7 16 uh, steel tubing. What I'm gonna do is cut this down to, I think it's 25 millimeters is supposed to be the width of this is supposed to fit on top of there. And I'm gonna, make, I'm gonna make an inner bushing that fits inside of this outer bushing. And then what I've purchased is liquid polyurethane. Um, and what this is, is this is what people will use to make their own uh, suspension bushings for their cars, for example. This is, this is Poly 75 series, so this is um, an A75 on the durometer scale as far as hardness goes. Now I have no idea if this is going to work to replace the Polstra bushings that I can't find, but this was the best solution I could come up with to try and test and see if we could figure out how to make our own bushings to work on the airplane here. Now the A75 should be between a car tire tread um, as far as hardness and a, um, you know, a, a, a heel of a shoe for example. So this should be pretty hard. Um, now, I did a lot of research on the Polster bushings to try and understand what was really the purpose of this rubber bushing that's supposed to fit onto the bolt here and connect to the airplane. My first thought was is that this was supposed to provide shock absorption, you know, vertically as the landing gear hit the ground, that this would provide a little bit of shock absorption between this fitting the landing gear and the fuselage. Now, after looking at the Polstra bushings, I, I think I, I have a better idea of what those were actually intended for. And it actually is not for shock absorption, like I mentioned. So this landing gear, if you do it according to the configuration in the plans, you're only supposed to have uh, one millimeter of clearance between the top edge of the landing gear here and the bottom of the fuselage when it passes across the bottom of the fuselage and connects between these two, these two brackets. Now, if you only have a millimeter of clearance between your landing gear bow and the bottom of the fuselage, that means that this cannot compress almost at all. If it compresses on landing a millimeter, your gear is gonna hit the bottom of your fuselage. So we don't want that. Um, but if you look at the specs for the Polster bushings, because it has this outer shell bushing and it's got an inner bushing and it's surrounded by rubber, um, the two inner and outer, or the inner and outer bushings are actually designed to be able to twist. 
um, with inside of each other. Uh, they are physically connected with the rubber, uh, but the rubber is designed to stretch. And I believe what the designer was really intending those bushings to be for is to act as a maintenance-free bushing um, that you could attach the landing gear here and then as you hit the ground when, upon landing, your landing gear will rotate like this a little bit. As your gear flexes, these will rotate. And these bushings here, which are attached and fixed to the fuselage on the outside, and then attached and fixed and bolted to the inside here, that rubber will turn and rotate in there and allow some flexibility between the inner and outer shell of the bushing. Now, I believe that's what the primary purpose of those Polster bushings was. It's not for shock absorption. Obviously, we've got a rubber tire connected to a spring gear connected to this, which rotates. There's no real reason to have any more shock absorption in that system than what we've already got within the tire and the, and the aluminum spring or the fiberglass spring gear that you have. So when I started looking at making something here to replace the Polster bushings, my initial thought was, well, why don't I just do a solid bushing? Why don't I just, you know, take an aluminum bushing or something and just put a hole in it and have the bolt go through it? The problem with that is, is that the bolt is then going to turn inside of whatever bushing I created, whether it was bronze or whether it was aluminum, and it's going to create friction. Um, that friction means that I'm going to have to lubricate it somehow. I'm going, it's going to get loose. It's going to rattle. Uh, those types of things will happen and all of that goes away if we have a rubber bushing inside of here instead of you know metal to metal contact you know between a bolt and uh, and a solid bushing so my goal is to try and cut these parts and I'm actually gonna do a test one I'm gonna go ahead and have these welded together but I'm gonna cut another piece like this I'm gonna cut off another a tube like this and what I'm gonna do is try and um, pour the liquid rubber in between the two layers and I'm going to create a little cap on either side that's made out of aluminum to hold it together while it hardens because it does take some time to dry and I'm going to attempt to make my own bushings. Now when I have this welded onto here, now I, I have to do the bushing part, the rubber part, after these are welded together. Um, obviously in my test one I just won't have the bracket on there at all, I just want to see if I can put it together, put it in a vise and twist it and see how well it holds up. <laughs> and see how strong it actually is and see how much play there actually is because again I don't want any I don't I don't want any vertical play like this to happen I want it to be very very stiff in this direction but I do want it to be able to twist a few degrees to be able to you know be a good replacement for that polster bushing um, so that's what I'm going to attempt to do I'm going to start off right now by just cutting these tubes to fit on top of here they're supposed to be I think 25 millimeters these bolts do need to be cut down I bought these extra long um, knowing that I needed a certain amount of grip length um, but the threads are really long on these bolts so I'll be I'll end up cutting off the threads because the only parts that part that needs to be threaded is from the you know inside of the bottom fitting on into where it's going to hit this bolt that goes in here uh, that's the only threaded part there is and then this uh, shaft part of this bolt will actually be inside of here and also be inside of whatever I make here for an inner bushing that is about 25 millimeters. So I'm going to cut these. I do have to ream this out because this is just slightly smaller hole than the uh, 5 16 bolt. Uh, so I will go ahead and ream that out and then we'll see if we can pour some rubber inside of there and see if we can make our own bushings. So today I'm going to attempt to make a bushing for the landing gear. So I've got the outer bushing which I created, the steel bushing that goes on the outside. I've got the inner bushing which I cut and fit. This is wider uh, than the outer bushing um, by about uh, five millimeters, I believe. This is around 25 millimeters and this is around 30 millimeters. And what I did is on my lathe, I created two end caps here. And these end caps are gonna allow me to keep this center bushing and this outer bushing in the right place with the right gap in the center that I'm gonna fill with this Polytech uh, 75 series liquid rubber. Uh, and so what I'm gonna attempt to do is just mix a small amount of that in even parts and go ahead and fill that gap in between these two bushings. And then what I'll do is I'll put the top cap that fits on top of here like so. And then I'm just gonna use some uh, clamps that I have. I'll slide this onto this clamping assembly here and we'll just screw the top on top of here and I'll just let this sit 
um, for 16 hours it says and then I can take this off the caps off the end of this and then it's supposed to take up to seven days to fully harden um, I think I'll wait those seven days before I do too much testing with this because I don't want to twist the inner bushing outside of the outer bushing I really want that bond uh, to occur as much as possible the other thing I am going to do is I haven't gone and cleaned out the inside of these bushings. I want to scuff up the inside of these bushings and clean them so that I get as good of bond as I can to the outside of the inner bushing and the inside of the outer bushing. And then when we pop this out, we should be able to do some testing on it and see how stiff it is, see how loose it is or how much compression I can do on it and then how much we can twist it uh, and see if this will work well for uh, bushings on the Cree Cree for the landing gear. So I'm going to attempt to mix this stuff up and uh, and I'll go ahead and record that while I'm doing it. Okay, I did open this uh, Poly 75 series liquid rubber uh, containers. Um, I hadn't looked at this before, but these this is pretty much a pure liquid. Um, I was a little bit concerned that maybe this stuff was a little bit uh, rubbery, but it's 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 actually quite a bit it's very very much a liquid form not not even like epoxy it's more like the hardener one of the things i did pick up is i picked up some of these glass um, eyedroppers at the craft store so i'm going to use these eyedroppers to suck up each one of the different um i've got two different ones i'm going to use one for the hardener and one for the the rubber material to mix in a cup so that i can get the correct amounts of of, of each uh each of the parts um, and then I'm also going to use a separate one to suck that up and hopefully use that to get this rubber poured around these bushings, which is a little bit tight. So uh, I did want to show you that. I also did pick up at the craft store. I have no idea how well this is going to work, but this is some uh, cast and craft mold release and conditioner. It's really made for like silicone molds for, for uh, you know, using resin. I don't know if it's going to work for this uh, polytech or polyurethane, but I'm going to try it. What I want to do is at least put that on my aluminum uh, um, parts that I made here to cap off the end of this while I, you know, after I poured the rubber in and letting it harden. I'm hoping that uh, nothing really sticks too much to these because I do want to reuse these. All right, the first try here was a bit of a fail. Um, a couple things I noticed is once I started sucking up the liquid rubber into um, these uh, eyedroppers that I have, this is actually much thicker than it appears in the container. In the container, it seems very liquidy, but when you try and suck it up into an eyedropper, um, the, the viscosity of it is, is actually quite thick. And so it was difficult for me to measure using this device because of the amount of air I was getting in there when I sucked it up, it was difficult for me to tell how much of each I had in, in there, even though it was you know, maybe halfway up in the eyedropper. Once I squeezed it and put it in the container, there was so much air mixed with the thicker viscosity um, liquid that it didn't really act as a good measurement. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my electric scale or my uh, digital scale here, and I'm actually gonna weigh it out just like I would um, the epoxy. So I'm gonna try and put an equal amount in each one of these. I'll do it by weight and then I'll mix it together. The other thing I found out is that I just didn't mix enough of it either. I'm gonna need a lot more than I thought I was gonna need even just to fill that little uh, eighth inch gap around these metal bushings. So I'm cleaning everything up. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start over from scratch and remix this again one more time. And I've gotta, re, uh, I've gotta clean my uh, little ca end cap there. So let me get everything cleaned up and we'll try this one more time.
I thought I'd show this to you. I went ahead and mixed up uh, a total of 20 grams of this rubber material, this 75 uh, polyurethane. Um, I've let this sit here for maybe an hour. Um, it's already hard. Um, I wouldn't say it's obviously fully cured, but it's actually rubbery and stiff like rubber. It is not, uh, you know, liquid at all. Um, I found that very interesting. So this actually does cure fairly quickly. It's making me wonder if I shouldn't be taking my form out of there and just allowing that to sit overnight instead of waiting the 16 hours to pull it apart. Um, obviously if I were going to try and maybe take this out of this mold it, it might fall apart or destroy itself or something like that but I'm thinking with my clamped together piece here if that's hardened like that already this has to have already hardened in here um, hmm, I'm trying to figure out what I should do here I might actually take this apart and see what it looks like let me think about this <laughs> if I take it apart I'll show you what it looks like Okay, I, I did take it out of the clamping uh, structure thing or clamping thing that I had here on this. I decided not to pop these off just because I think this is soft enough right now that I could end up turning this inside bushing and breaking the, uh, you know, the bond between that and the rubber. So I think I will wait till tomorrow morning, which would be the... Uh, 16 hours that it recommends that I wait and then I'm going to carefully pop these off without twisting this so that I don't break this uh, You know break the bond in between here while it's while it's curing um, so I think that's what I'm going to do and uh, We'll see what it looks like then and then what I'll do is I'll just let that sit You know for the uh, seven days or whatever that it recommends before I start uh, putting any pressure on it or start playing with it so I'm going to continue to finish up these fittings here uh, for the landing gear. Um, I So what I'm going to do is I've, I've got to do that curved notch hole here and create kind of the clamping mechanism that's going to allow that bolt to clamp down onto the gear. And what we're going to do is we're just going to use an end mill to do a little cutout here. And we're going to cut off about 0.3 millimeters to allow this to uh, have some ability to clamp and actually clamp down on the gear instead of it just hitting here all the way across. We still want it to hit on the ends here so we've got about three millimeters or so of contact at the tip here that needs to be on the ends but then we can actually uh, have a little bit of a gap here to to, to be able to clamp down with our uh, with our bolts. Now just a comment on this if I were going to make these again I would do these 32 millimeters top to bottom all the way across including these end parts. I'm actually a little bit close um, on my spacing here at the end between the edge of this bolt hole and the bottom of this fitting here it should be right about five millimeters and I'm at right about four millimeters or actually slightly less at the end here now down here I've got the full five millimeters plus a little bit uh, you know where the threads actually are but on the end of this fitting I'm a little bit a little bit short if I had done this 32 millimeters all the way across instead of 30 then I would have had a you know I wouldn't have the little step down here and then I would have had a lot more space to be able to shape the bottom of this and uh, and get this looking uh, looking the way it should a, a little bit more uniform I, sh I really should have done that from the beginning but I didn't realize when I cut this outer piece that I was going to end up having to do uh, a hole here that was a, a one and a half millimeters taller um, and that's one of the reasons I made this center part here where the threads go for these bolts a little bit taller but I'm going to have to shape this a little bit different here and like I said my tolerances or my uh, actual edge distance here is, is, is lower than it should be and uh, if I were going to make these again I just I would do these 32 millimeters tall all the way across just to give yourself some extra space and that's really just for anything that's a 5 8 gear or if you're using the Grove landing gear um, having that extra bit of uh, height in these to be able to uh, shape them would, would be helpful. So I finished the next step here which was to cut this oval um, part out of this uh, fitting here. Part of that is to provide some spring when we clamp this together as I mentioned before but they also show the um, uh, 
the uh, brake line going through this hole as it goes up the gear it's supposed to go through this hole and then into the fuselage so that appears to be the other reason for that uh, gap inside of there um, but I also trimmed this surface here down with 0.3 millimeters so that I could get that tiny gap that you can see there um, and again that's what gives us a little bit of the um, uh, the ability to clamp down on that gear a little bit more by taking up that space with the bolts when we clamp this together. So I've completed those two things. Now I think the next step is going to be to start shaping these. And, you know, we'll go ahead and get this angle cut down on either side and uh, we'll start rounding the edges on these. So I'm just getting ready to leave the shop today and I went ahead and cut this um, plastic cup here that I had poured that initial uh, test into for the rubber here. Um, this it, it's hard. I mean it might get stiffer, but it's certainly not coming apart um, It actually seems to be perfectly Tolerable to come out of any kind of form it's in and not waiting the 16 hours I'm not sure why you would need to do that, but I went ahead and popped off one of the caps on This bushing here and it looks good I'm just gonna see if I can get the other end off and then I will let this sit uh, before I play with it too much especially overnight um, but it looks like it's it worked well uh, the question is is just how much or how pliable is this I actually don't want it to be too pliable and uh, this actually seems it's stiff but I can certainly compress it here as you can see so that's maybe it'll harden up more that's actually softer than I would have thought this would have been I mean that's to me this is not really car tire well, maybe it is. I don't know. Car tire always seemed a little bit stiffer to me than that. But um, let me see if I can get the other end off of this, and we'll take a look at it tomorrow. So I've decided to go ahead and try and make a new set of these clamps for the gear. Um, so I've, I've cut out new blocks here. Uh, I had extra material, and I thought, you know, I wasn't quite happy with how these turned out because of this step that I had here in the end. And it wasn't the step that was the problem, it was really the fact that when I drilled these bolts into the end here, I drilled them up from the bottom of this surface here and not from the bottom of the step. So this bolt ended up a little bit lower than it should have been, um, at least in comparison with the actual top edge or the center here that, uh, that, that where the clamping part is. Um, and so what ended up happening then is the edge distance between this bolt and this bottom section here ended up being a little bit too small. It's about 3.75 millimeters and it really should be five millimeters. So that's actually what it is from this edge here inside where the threads are. It's, uh, it's got the five millimeter, but here it's, it's close to, um, you know, two millimeters or even a little bit more short. And the concern there is that when this is connected to the airplane and we get the bushings in here and everything, this bolt is wanting to break out the bottom like this. Uh, that's where the pressure is. It's, 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 the landing gear is pushing up on this, this is pushing back down, and this bolt is wanting to come out of the bottom of this fitting. And so by reducing this edge distance here, I'm really weakening this bracket to the point where, you know, a, on a hard landing, it's likely that this would crack on the bottom uh, and you know it's it's only two millimeters but I think it's gonna make enough of a difference because these these tolerances on these are, are pretty tight now the one thing I was concerned about one of the reasons I, I lowered that bolt a little bit is that the edge distance between the top edge here um, so between this edge and where the threads go in is is pretty close tolerance um, on the on the drawings it's actually quite close even these bolts here that go through are really close to the inside edge of these this bracket here but anyway i decided i'm gonna go ahead and try this one more time um, so what i did is i made these 32 millimeters tall instead of 30 so they're two millimeters taller i made this about one millimeter taller um, just to give myself a little bit extra space to cut out so what will happen is, is this is a millimeter taller i'm going to go ahead and recess it all the way into this piece and make sure that this is completely flush um, but it will allow me to cut out here an extra millimeter um, compared to what the, what the drawings originally had in it because I've got about, what, 1.3, maybe 1.5 millimeters of thicker thickness in the gear that is a little bit thicker. But by making these slightly bigger and a little bit taller, it's giving me a little bit more clearance 
and a little bit more adjustment that I can have with this end bolt here and also adjustment that I can have with the cutout for the for the gear. So that's what I've decided to do. It's 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 a fair amount of work, but it's not that big a deal. Um, I can cut these out on my mill fairly quickly, and now that I've done this once, I know what all the measurements are. I've got all the tools, I've got the drills and the taps and everything. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and try this one more time and see if I can get it a little bit better. I did want to comment on the rubber here that I set yesterday. This did get stiffer overnight, so I'm actually quite pleased at how stiff this ended up being. Um, it does feel much more like a car tire now as far as the hardness or even a, a the, you know a rubber heel on a uh, on a shoe um, so i really think this is going to work quite well inside of this bushing now the question is is will this inner bushing and outer bushing twist at all i'm not really sure i mean i think this needs to be this stiff so that there's not flexing inside of here you know with these bushings at, at least this way between each other um, but whether or not these will actually twist inside is is another story i really don't want to try twisting it quite yet because i think this needs to cure a little bit more i'm a little bit concerned because in the plastic container there was you know somewhat of a sticky edge around the outside of this when i peeled it away you know kind of like resin does where it doesn't really cure around the very edge until you take it out and let it dry that's probably happening inside of here also between the steel bushing and the rubber itself. I have a feeling if I tried to turn it right now, I would actually just start twisting and actually break loose the rubber inside of there, but I really don't know. Um, maybe since it's inside there, it would actually bond to it, um, but I, I really don't know how this stuff actually works. But I'm very impressed with this. This, I mean, if you were to make uh, poly bushings for your car, this would work quite well. Uh, this material is actually pretty cool. Um, got to figure out what to do with the rest of that can though because I've got uh, a quart of this stuff and boy I can make a lot of these bushings with a quart of, uh, of that material but anyway let me go back to the mill I'm gonna go ahead and start milling these out see if I can get these fit together just like these and we'll see how long it takes here for me to get these fixed I finished doing the initial cuts on these parts so that I've got now the bottom part and the top part that fit inside of each other. I did a little bit better job on making these because now these are actually interchangeable um, and fit exactly inside of of each other. Whereas the other ones I kind of did, you know, I did these so that they, they only fit inside of, a, in other words, these were a match set before. These two only fit together and these two only fit together because they were just slightly different. Um, whereas these, I've got, I've got a nice perfect fit on both of these with exactly the same amount of uh, play inside of each one of them, which isn't really much at all. I mean, they literally just slip into each other, which is great. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and cut the top part here, um, notch this out for the landing gear and get the top part down to that, uh, I think it's six millimeters thick on top here. I'll do that on both. And we'll come back and recut the bottoms. All right, I've got a few things to talk about here. So before I left yesterday, I was able to remake these clamps for the landing gear. These turned out perfect. I mean, I really am very happy with these. These are interchangeable this way and interchangeable with these uh, each other. So I was able to make these very accurately the second time. And you can see I've got my gap that's supposed to be there, 0.3 millimeters, you know, to allow a little bit of clamping pressure when you tighten these bolts. But everything with these turned out great the second time. As I said, I did make these slightly larger and that these are 32 millimeters. Uh, top to bottom instead of 30. It just gave me a little bit of extra room with getting these bolts in here uh, and compensating for the fact that the gear is a little bit taller um, being uh, you know 5 8 uh, versus the metric measurements that are in the plans. So very happy with these. I just obviously have to do some cleanup on on these angle some of the edges round everything off. So uh, I'm just trying to get these to the point where I can start doing some test fitting. Um, I think today I might go back and do the angles that need to go on the end here um, and uh, shape these a little bit, but we'll see. So I did uh, just get back from the welder and he went ahead and TIG welded these brackets for the landing gear for me. They turned out pretty good. Um, now I'm using a much thicker uh, tubing material for the bushing area. 
Um, so I was hoping to not have to install the little fillet plates that they recommend that you install on either side of these brackets. Honestly, I really didn't want to go to the welder and take these to him and say, yeah, weld these tubes on either side, and then I need you to weld this plate on either side. You're literally talking 24 welds on all of these parts, and I'm not sure it's 100% necessary. Um, the reason I believe those fillet plates are supposed to be on here is really to prevent this from twisting. Uh, so as we talked about before with the bushings, um, these bushings need to be able to rotate a little bit, and that's going to apply some twisting force on this. And my guess is, is that over time, you could have a crack here develop in this weld um, because of the flexing between this tube here and the plate here when when you're landing because again It's going to constantly want to want to flex and bend this out I believe that's what the purpose of that was but I'm gonna try and do without that I'm not sure it's necessary especially because I was able to do or he was able to do a little bit better weld here uh, with the thicker materials and I think so I've got so I think I've got a stronger weld here and we're just going to go with this. This is probably something that should be checked at the annual inspection anyway um, to just make sure there's no cracks and nothing wrong with uh, any of the landing gear components. But now that I have these made, I can go ahead and create the bushings or, or you know pour the bushings that are supposed to be installed in here. But I wanted to do some testing with the bushing that I made here first. And of course, it's only been two days since I, you know, since I molded this bushing and created this piece of rubber here. I'm like I said before, I'm very happy with how stiff this is. I think this is this is probably about the right consistency uh, needed for these landing gear bushings. Um, but what I want to do is I want to put this in the vise here, and what I want to do is twist it and see how much twist I can get between the inner bushing and outer bushing. Now, upon landing, um, I, it, between no weight on the aircraft at all and actually gross weight, it's less than two degrees. It's like 1.8 degrees that this has to rotate the outside bushing within the inside bushing. So we're not talking about a lot of movement. And I know the Polstra bushings, they said that they could twist up to 20 degrees which is a lot um i'm not sure that this poly is this isn't going to flex that much so either this is going to break loose around the inner bushing or uh or it's going to be really stiff and not want to move that far no way it's going to move 20 degrees but two degrees probably wouldn't be an issue so i'm going to go ahead and put this in here i'm going to need two hands to do it so i'll be back in just a second all right, I'm laughing right now because I just had to redo this video, uh, at least this part here where I was testing this. Um, so I've got this clamped into the vise now. I've got vise grips on the outside of it. And what I'm wanting to test is to see how much I can rotate this and how stiff it is. Now, uh, uh, when I tested before with no weight on the landing gear and then I put the gross weight on it, which was 400 pounds, um, we saw that the, the center of the gear bowed down, I think it was around 3 eighths of an inch. Um, that three-eighths of an inch at this bushing point would equal about 1.8 degrees of rotation. Um, now, the rotation of the Polstra bushings was supposed to be good up to 20 degrees, which is, it's quite a bit. Um, I'm not expecting this to rotate this much, but what I wanted to test was to see how stiff it was in rotating it. So I've got a clamp in the vise, I've got vise grips on it so that the two parts are uh, you know, physically held so that I can just flex the rubber in the middle and see how it rotates uh, and how stiff it is and if it breaks loose of either of the inner or outer bushing because I don't know how well this material is actually going to bond to steel. And it's only been two days since I poured this. It hasn't, it hasn't been the full seven days that it's supposed to be till it cures, although this, this is fully cured. I, I don't see that this would cure any more than this. But the bonding inside of here could take longer to cure because it's it's internal and it's not been exposed to air but I don't know exactly what the chemical makeup of, of this rubber stuff is so anyway, I've got this clamped in here I've got the vice grips on it and you can see I can flex it and I'm using a little bit of force not too much but I'm able to flex this bushing far more than it would ever flex during landing and it's it's held in there hard I mean it's not rotating this is actually pretty impressive. So I'm taking this and I'm able to flex it either direction. 
and it is solidly bonded between the inner bushing and outer bushing. So quite happy with this. Now I can, if I grab a hold of this and I try and twist it this way, I can get a tiny bit of flex in that bushing. It's not a lot, um, but it is a tiny bit. Uh, but if the force is upward on this across the entire bushing, even at 100 pounds, which is what each one of these is carrying, I don't think that inner bushing is going to move much up and down compared to the outer bushing, um, which is a good thing. We don't have a lot of gap in there anyway that's even filled with, with that rubber material. But as I mentioned before, this is the purpose of these bushings, is it's supposed to do this. Upon landing, it's supposed to provide a solid can or solid connection between the landing gear and the brackets and allow it to flex like this and actually right now this this poly material is working perfectly now I could pull this really hard and see what it takes to actually break it but I mean I'm pulling on it pretty hard right now and it's just flexing back and forth which is exactly what we wanted this to do this is perfect this is perfect <laughs> I'm quite happy with this. This worked out so well uh, that uh, I can't even think of a better solution for doing for for for, for this uh, application and and using this this poly bushing setup um, works great. This is this is exactly what it sh this is exactly how it should work. All right. So what I'm going to do now is now that I have these plates welded up, I'm going to go ahead and cut a little slot in the top of here so that I can actually fit. Uh, you know these on the ends with the brackets in place and I'm going to go ahead and put an inner bushing in there and we're going to go ahead and pour and make our bushings inside of here now the great thing is is I know this stuff hardens within a couple of hours so I'm just going to use one set of these I'll pour one I'll wait a couple hours I'll pour another one you know mix another one out you know I'll just do these a couple hours apart and they'll be done I don't have to wait seven days uh, to have these uh, um, you know, to have this stuff dry before I can reuse my little, uh, my little, uh, covers that go on there to hold the, uh, bushings in the place, which is good. Um, so, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start working on some of this. I'm going to go start making these bushings and, uh, I'll go ahead and start to final, uh, shaping these, uh, these brackets here, but we're getting pretty close to being able to try and start test fit fitting some of this onto the airplane. I pulled the, uh, forms off of the first one of these uh, brackets that I created a bushing for. Um, I'm finding out that this rubber actually dries quite fast. I only waited an hour and a half before I pulled that off and this stuff is rubbery. It's not, it's not as stiff as it will be in final form, um, but it's easy to remove any kind of forms you have, especially like this. You know, probably about an hour would be plenty. Um, which is good because now I can move on to getting the other three done. Um, you can see I did the uh, angles here on the top of these uh, clamps. The only thing I have left to do is some finishing stuff with some beveled edges on the sides and uh, final cleanup. But uh, these are in a position right now where they would actually fit um, once I get the uh, rest of the bushings made and I can start uh, testing the fit on the fuselage. Now mine, because my gear is completely flat across the top, um, these will sit basically uh, perpendicular to the ground and won't be at the angle that they show in the plans because I'm not mounting this on the curved part of the bow of the fiberglass gear. So um, it's gonna be interesting to see how these fit. Uh, I don't know uh, how far I can get these or how far up I can get these as close to the fuselage as possible or if I'm gonna hit these corners here, which I probably will. Um, it's part of the reason I think there's a bevel on these is that they're supposed to be tilted and then they can be moved up a little bit higher, but I'm gonna start checking the fit on these on the fuselage before I get to the point of actually beveling the edges and trying to uh, final uh, finish those. So let me go finish the uh, other three of these clamps so we can start uh, fitting this uh, onto the fuselage. Um, I did finish pouring and creating the rubber bushings in here. Uh, three of these worked out great. The last one that I did, I didn't mix this right. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what happened because I was trying to use the same process I did on everything else, but uh, it's actually a different color. It's uh, almost a white color in here. And I think what I'm gonna have to do is pull this out and redo this one. I'm not sure if I just got the mixture a little bit wrong uh, in the end. It's part of the, 
It's part of the issue with trying to mix up such a small amount since I was only mixing up three grams of each of the ingredients. It's very easy to get uh, just a little bit off on one and then have a situation like this where it obviously didn't cure right. So I'm gonna pull that out, just clean it up, and I'll go ahead and re-pour that one and see if I can get that one fixed. But uh, the rest of these are a nice even color. Um, I was also keeping the cup that I was mixing this in so I could go back and test and see how stiff the material got, see if it cured and hardened properly. And this last one that I did when I went back to the, uh, the, the Dixie cup that I had, uh, it did not cure properly. So all the other three here, I went back and tested those. They seem all fine. They seem to have the exact same consistency and stiffness. Uh, so I think those are good, but I'll go ahead and redo this one. Then we should be ready to start fitting some of this onto the airplane. I have one of these brackets um, finished in its rough form. Uh, I did have to spend some time cutting these bolts off. They need to be shorter because they actually screw into here and will hit the threads of these bolts going through here. Um, and then I also cut a little bit off of the end of these bushings that are sticking out in the center. I originally did these at 30 millimeters wide. I've cut them down to about 28 millimeters wide, so I took about a millimeter off of each side. Um, what that allowed me to do is get the steel washer inside of there that is supposed to be between the aluminum bracket and the steel uh, bushings here. And when I've done that now, I've got it to the point where if I put it on the side of the fuselage, let me see the front and back, it goes this way. If I come over here to the fuselage, this is actually fitting right where it should. Hold on a second. So this is supposed to fit right between this hole here that's already in place. This is where the aft pin goes for the, uh, the, the wing spar. Um, and then this uh, front bracket here is supposed to basically line up with the edge of the opening here for the spar itself for the main wing. And if we hold this up here and line that up, we can see we've got a perfect centering the hole there and we're right on the edge over on this side. So I'm at a point now where I can start lining this up and, and, and start drilling the holes in here. Um, now we're gonna, let me show you something that's a little bit different about this bracket. I shouldn't say different, but we're gonna have to position it a little bit different according to the drawings here. So this is a drawings view from the aft side of the airplane, I believe. But you can see the original landing gear bow for the fiberglass one is, is, is bowed all the way to the fuselage where this mounting part here, the clamping part here, is supposed to be still on part of the radius of the bow. Now with the Grove gear that I'm using, I don't, I don't have this radius starting until it gets outside um, you know, right outside of this bracket point, it starts to bend. Um, so I don't have this curve here, which means these are going to be, uh, you know, parallel with the sides of the fuselage or, you know, perpendicular to the, the fuselage itself. It's not gonna be tilted, it's gonna be flat. Um, I still wanna position these in exactly the same spot so that if this is turned, it's still, you know, clearing the bottom of the fuselage like this one would if it was turned. So um, there's gonna be a little bit of gap uh, there and of course we do have rivets on the bottom of the airplane that we need to clear um, and and but my landing gear because this is turned flat is going to have a gap underneath the fuselage all the way along whereas you can see in the plans here we're only supposed to have about a millimeter of clearance here underneath the fuselage at the point that the bow comes in for the for the fiberglass gear and and almost contacts the the fuselage 